Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Thanks, Tim, for leading us in prayer this morning. Before we uh, read God's word together, I want to just offer a few opening comments uh, as we lead into that. So in our series now, through the contemporary testimony, we are coming to a section that is titled, The Fall. And this title is an important one, actually. It's not the mistake or the deception. It's the fall. You see, if it was the mistake, then perhaps behavior training would solve the problem. Or if it was the deception, then maybe better education or some higher level of knowledge would solve the problem. But it's called the fall because only a savior who can rescue us can solve the problem. Now, what's the problem? Well, humanity, of course, has been asking itself that question for, I suspect, millennia. And we need to establish the fact that there is a problem, isn't there? Maybe this is the most verifiable fact in all of human history, that things are not the way they're supposed to be. There is a problem. Sometimes we call it evil or wrongdoing or suffering. Of course, there's a problem with our world, and there's evidence in abundance. Broken families, drive-by shootings, terrorist attacks, homelessness, alcohol abuse, greed, polluted rivers, all are symptoms or signs of the problem. But is there a core problem, a foundational one? Is there a problem that lies at the root of all that's wrong in our world? Some will say it's the systems that are the problem. Misguided religious systems, unjust political systems, less than adequate social systems, poor education. These people believe that inherently all people are good. Everyone's slate is clean when they enter the world. We're basically foundationally good. And it's the systems, whatever they might be, structures, things that we encounter in life, there is the problem. And we need to be liberated from those things. Bad parents, bad schools, bad television, bad governments, bad religious myths. These are the problem. And in this view, the problem is outside of us. It happens to us. You could say that we're the victims. Hey, this person says, it's not my fault. Some others will say, there really is no problem per se. The idea of right and wrong is relatively true, but there's no such thing as absolute truth. I mean, we're all products of our environment, and as people live together, we try to negotiate what we think is right and what we think is wrong, what we think is better behavior and what we think is worse behavior. Each culture sees things a little bit differently. And so we can't make absolute moral claims on anyone. There is no ultimate moral truth. So really, there is no problem per se. Rather, we are creatures that are simply evolving to higher and better forms of existence, like has been happening for the last five billion years. We may encounter what we feel is like evil or wrong, but because we're physical creatures and because our actions and thoughts are, are simply the result of 
chemical reactions that all happen in our brain according to natural or physical laws. Those things are just playing themselves out the way that they do. And it's happening to us in a predetermined way. This is called determinism. There is no problem per se. What happens, happens. Nature, after all, has its way. And then there are others who say the real problem is sin. And sin in the natural cosmos originated in us. This is, in fact, what we find in a foundational story of the Bible, which we're going to read this morning, likely written 3,500 years ago or thereabouts. We know it's a very old story because it contains many images and even many similarities with other ancient Near Eastern writings from Mesopotamia, Babylon, from Egypt. It contains many images that are similar to those writings. This story, therefore, was written at a particular time to a particular group of people in a particular way. And they would have understood it. And we look to it this morning. Let's turn to Genesis 3, the word of the Lord. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return." Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. 
He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove out the man, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So this ancient story, likely written around 1400 BC, we don't know for sure, but throughout the Jewish and Christian tradition, they've, we've believed that this book, this story has been authored by Moses, along with all the stories in the first five books of the Bible. And many Old Testament scholars believe that the people of Israel who first received the story in its present form, it's possible that this story had circulated many centuries before Moses orally or maybe in various kinds of writings. But Old Testament scholars believe that the people of Israel who first received this story in the form that we have it was likely when they were in the wilderness. Between the time of being rescued from Egypt and entering the promised land. A time, yes, when they experienced God's gracious provision. Manna from heaven, food through quail and water from a rock. But also a time when they experienced a great deal of suffering. You know that the generation that left Egypt never made it to the promised land. They died in the wilderness there on account of disobediences and grumblings. You can read all about it in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. God, the people of Israel in the wilderness, must have thought, why so much hardship? Why so much suffering? When they were in Egypt... It was those oppressive Egyptians that were the problem. It was the system that caused all the problems. And at times when they were in the wilderness, they would grumble and blame God for all the problems. And by doing that, they were behaving just like the people of the neighboring nations who worshipped Fickle gods, gods who sometimes brought blessing, but at other times brought trouble and hardship. Fickle gods who you had to appease with just the right things when they were in a good mood to get blessings and benefit. In the wilderness, they were just like those people and blamed God for their troubles and hardships. There was no naturalistic worldview in the ancient world. Believing that all just evolved and that all that is is material. That's a very modern notion, maybe three to four hundred years old. So God reveals to Moses a true story of what likely took place many centuries before. So that Israel and all of her descendants, that's us too, would know the true problem that lies at the heart of the human experience. This story, as I said, has many parallels to other stories in the ancient Near East. We often call them origin stories. Images like the serpent, dust from the ground, fig leaves, fruit, the cool of the day. These were images that Israel would have been familiar with. But at the same time, this story is completely unique, wholly different than those other origin stories. Though it shared images and concepts, this one was entirely different in its meaning and its thrust. And quite frankly... In my mind, in the mind of many, many others, to this day, this, there is no other story or philosophy or idea that can better explain the true problem at the heart of our human experience. 
The story begins with a snake. I read not that long ago that some are believing that we are hardwired. It's like through the evolutionary process, we are hardwired to be afraid of, of snakes and scorpions. They've done tests on children, presenting them with pictures, and then they see how their eyeballs dilate, how they react. The snake has always been a slippery creature. One of the few things to this day that frightens me out of my sleep, what I'd call a bad dream, is a snake. <laughs> the only thing that gives me a bad dream, it's always a snake biting my legs. I don't know about you. But in the ancient world, the serpent was viewed as possessing kind of mystical wisdom, a demonic and, and hostile creature. Some cultures saw it endowed with a kind of divine wisdom. It was even venerated, believed to have a certain kind of power. Sometimes they associated it with chaotic evil. The Egyptian pharaoh wore the uraeus on his crown, a snake, symbolizing his sovereignty and his authority. Well, this serpent, this snake enters God's good garden. The story doesn't care to tell us where the serpent came from or why it's deceptive and cunning. People would have clued in that, that this was a kind of intruder. This serpent came to the woman and the man and planted in their mind a seed of doubt about why God told them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And notice with me how they're invited to question God's goodness. So far in the story, God has only shown himself to be a giver, giving good gifts, a good creation filled with abundance and beauty and food and goodness, the opportunity for work and vocation. So far, God has only shown himself to be a good and gracious giver. But the serpent presents God not as one who shares his gifts, rather as one who withholds them. Pause with me. How often don't we or others feel like we must take something from God? Take some blessing, take some benefit, take some goodness from him. Sometimes we might even feel like he owes us, either because we think our lives have been, you know, pretty good, God, come on. Or maybe our life has been so difficult and so hard, God, come on, cut me a break, will you? This strikes me as a very important part of this story. You could say that the fall into sin is a change in our posture before God. Instead of living lives of ongoing gratitude for all the goodness that God has gifted to us, we live as though God withholds what we need and we must take it. Think about that. This posture of taking is so prevalent in our world that so many live their lives thinking that they must take whatever they can. Pleasure, resources, power, you name it. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Is God a withholding God? Well, the woman replies, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Now, is, what, is that what God really said? I mean, he just said it in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Is that what God really said? No, actually, it's not. 
The woman failed to mention God's emphasis on their being invited to eat from any tree in the garden. Moreover, she failed to mention that there was another tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of life. And she only mentions the one tree, doesn't she? And then proceeds to put words in God's mouth. God said nothing about not touching it. As that seed of doubt is planted in the woman's mind and in the man's too, it would seem she's already questioning God, taking away and adding to what he had already abundantly made clear. And then comes the serpent's words, which in the Hebrew kind of jumps out at you. God said in chapter 2, you will certainly die. Two words in the Hebrew. And the serpent says to the woman, not you will certainly die. It jumps right out at you. He takes the very words of God and declares them false. And he goes on to say, God's trying to withhold something from you. God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes are going to be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So what you need to do is take it. And at this point in the story, we come to understand the basis or the foundation of all that's wrong in our world. Where it all started, and, and this is an important and, here is where it all started, and here is where every human being, you and me included, find themselves looking in a mirror. First, here's where it all started. Here in this moment in history, yes, I believe this is an actual story that took place, a real historical event. Why? Well, Jesus alludes to it in the Gospels, and a number of the gospel or the letters in the New Testament refer to this event as a historical event. Here in this historical moment, Adam and Eve, the first human parents, exercised an ability that only they had an ability that God had given only to them. They were created with freedom to make a choice. Human beings, we find our free moral agents. And that means when we make moral choices, we are the first cause of that choice. No one but ourselves is the source of that choice. Let me give you an illustration. Only this one because I read this, or my son, Jake, actually mentioned this article to me this week. Imagine you're walking behind Bill Gates. Why do I mention Bill Gates? Well, this is the article. I heard that in, read that in the last year, Bill Gates, his wealth increased so much that he earned $1,300 every second. The article goes on to say that if he earns that much money in one second, if he were to drop a $100 bill on the street, it wouldn't even be worth his time to pick it up. So you're walking behind Bill Gates. He drops a $1,000 bill and you see it fall. He's oblivious to it. There's absolutely no one around who will see what you do. What do you do? He's not going to miss it. Do you put it in your pocket? Or do you get his attention and return it? We are the first cause of that choice. It's not biological, chemical, brain activity that forces us to make one choice or the other. God has made us free moral agents. Adam and Eve had a choice. It's interesting how in this passage, 
Adam or Eve rather we see being described as doing three things and Bible scholars have connected that to a verse in scripture 1 John 2:16 let me just read that for you for everything in the world the lust of the flesh that's one thing the lust of the eyes the second and the pride of life comes not from the father but from the world now think about that the lust of the flesh that's our bodily desires and lusts eve saw that the fruit was good for food that's the first lust the lust of the eyes she saw that it was pleasant to look at and the pride of life which she saw this fruit was desirable for making her wise she had a choice she saw that this was uh, pleasing to the flesh for food was pleasing to the eyes a, a delight that she could covet and moreover it would elevate her in some way giving her wisdom in fact in the ancient near eastern world enabling her to be like god adam and eve wanted to be like god that is what the knowledge of good and evil represented in the ancient world that was a god knowledge and adam and eve wanted it that's what took place historically but i also said this story is like a mirror for us we see ourselves in this story don't we we know the lust of the flesh what our bodies want food sexual pleasure other physical pleasures we know the lust of the eyes we see the delights and the treasures that exist in our world recently i've been watching vacation rentals on netflix where you see a, a, a budget rental a middle cost rental and an extravagant rental and it takes you to some beautiful places in the world some beautiful rental properties and i tell you it's boy i'd like to go there we see the the lust of our eyes and don't we pursue things that elevate us what we read in john as the pride of our lives don't we see things in our world that we want that elevate us elevate our status elevate the way people will look at us because of how we look or how we drive or what we drive or what we own how much we know aren't there things that we do in pride to elevate ourselves above others we want to be like god we want to be our own gods we want to be the own source of authority create our own morality this says the bible lies at the heart of all human sin the contemporary testimony reads like this in the beginning of human history our first parents walked with god but rather than living by the creator's word of life they listened to the serpent's lie and fell into sin and in their rebellion they tried to be like god as sinners adam and eve feared the nearness of god and hid it is only in the christian world view that the problem of evil and suffering makes sense and notice what happens notice the consequences of sin first sin corrupts our relationship with god they quickly cover themselves they felt shame before god and before each other but most importantly before god because they hid from him something happened something happened that was morally wrong and the first instinct is to hide from god christians have always believed that 
all things that we do which are not the way they're supposed to be, those things that we do which are wrong against other people, against creation, maybe against ourselves, Christians have always believed that all those things are firstly a sin against God. The second thing we notice is how sin corrupts our relationships with others. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. Evasion, blame, blaming, finger pointing, superiority, bitterness, and pride are all elements of the, the social breakdown that we begin to see happening in this story. And that continues right through chapters 4 to 11 of Genesis. And we see that somehow all of nature, all of creation is corrupted. In this story, we see that sinfulness and rebellion ruptures the physical order as well as the moral order. Childbearing and family life would become a matter of pain and sorrow. The earth will produce thorns and, and thistles, work which God designed in Genesis 1 to be creative and fulfilling, now is drudgery and toil. And finally, we're told that we're going to return to the dust from which we came, which is death. Death and all of those physical infirmities that we experience, which finally, ultimately, bring us to death. C.S. Lewis and many others have observed that death has no place in the original creation. It entered our physical world as well as our physical bodies because of the fall. In fact, Paul says in Romans 8, creation itself is in bondage to decay. As Charles Colson writes in his book, How Shall We Live?, at the fall, every part of creation was plunged into the chaos of sin, and every part cries out for redemption. Only the Christian worldview keeps these true, two truths in balance. The radical destruction caused by sin and the hope of restoration to the original created goodness. This is a dark story, a depressing story. But even in the presence of our fall into sin, God's goodness is exposed. Three things. God calls out for them. God searches for them. God provides clothing for them. God promises a seed or a descendant whose heel will be bruised but whose foot will crush the serpent and its lies. God promises a seed who we might call a wounded victor. And that wounded victor came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Going back to John chapter 2, verse 16, looking at those three parts of the verse, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, we heard how that was experienced by the first Adam. But think about how it was experienced by Jesus, who the Bible calls the second Adam, right? The lust of the flesh. Remember how our Lord Jesus was tempted to turn that stone into bread for food but he resisted. Remember how our Lord Jesus was tempted to see all the kingdoms of the world, the lust of the eyes, all that power could be mine. But the Lord Jesus resisted. And then finally, the, the pride that makes one wise the pride of life. Jesus, show the world who you really are. Throw yourself off the temple. You know that the angels will catch you so that you won't even hurt your foot against a stone. 
elevate your glory for all to see. And Jesus resisted. This is the descendant that entered human history. Entering into your situation and mine. Entering into humanity. Taking on flesh. Becoming one of us in every way. Except for sin. This Jesus accomplished for us what we could not do for ourselves. And more than that, brought an end to death, to sin, to the devil. A death that began 2,000 years ago and is not yet complete, but continues to this day. When Jesus himself was on a tree, was his heel bruised? You're darn right it was. He was lashed, he was tortured, he was spit on, he was shamed. All the powers of the world, the Roman Empire and its representative in Pilate, Pilate, the religious empire and its representatives in the Jewish leaders, all the powers of the world lashed out at Jesus to execute him. You bet his heel was bruised. But he rose victorious from the grave. And the head of the serpent was destroyed. Death was destroyed. And we were given the new beginning of resurrection life. My friends. The flaming swords that cut off Adam and Eve from the presence of God. And many Old Testament scholars would say this. I think it's important to mention. Many Old Testament scholars would say, when Israel first read that story, what most troubled them was not that they lost all of the benefits of Eden, the goodness of that creation, the fruit, and the ability to work without pain or without toil. That firstly was not what caused them so much trouble when they read this story. It was being cut off from the presence of the living God. And in Jesus, that God has entered into our history. And poured out his presence, the Holy Spirit, on all who will turn to God. And not say to him, oh Lord, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Or, oh Lord, I got it wrong. I've been deceived. I believed a lie. Give me better education. No. To all those who turn to God in faith and say, I have sinned. I repent. I need a Savior. Jesus has said, This day, You can be with me in paradise. This day is the day of your salvation. Welcome the Holy Spirit into your life. That you may know the presence of the living God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.